Good morning. And uh, welcome to the strategy program. Uh, and welcome to the first course. I'm going to introduce you to uh, the key strategy ideas and content, uh, uh, concepts that you're going to use throughout your career. Um, I want to start, though, I'll give you a little bit of background about me, and then we'll get into the topic fairly quickly. Um, so, as you know, my name is Jeff Dyer. I uh, actually got my MBA here uh, 25 years ago <coughs> at BYU, and then I uh, got a job at a gaming company. And I still remember, uh, you know, the body gets older, but sometimes the mind remembers certain things. And uh, I remember I got the offer at Bain Company, and my classmates at BYU came to me and they said, you know, Jeff, we don't get this. We know you, and we know you don't know that much. So how is it possible that you could go into companies and tell seasoned executives what the company strategy is supposed to be? How are you going to do that? And I was, you know, I didn't know that much. So I was just like, oh, I don't know. Hopefully, <laughs> figure it out. Um, and then I learned something along the way. And uh, I want to share with you a couple of things that I learned about uh, strategy and strategy consulting. The first is illustrated in this particular cartoon. Well, shoot, I just can't figure it out. I'm moving over 500 donuts a day, but I'm just barely squeaking by. Now, my guess is it's taken most of you about five seconds to develop a theory as to what the problem is, right? And it's because you can see something that somehow the proprietor cannot. And it's because you, you've sort of, you're stepping back Sort of objectively, you see the big picture, and you have a hypothesis to why those donuts are flying, but not to customers. And um, one of the things I've learned about strategy is that it requires stepping back to look at the big picture. So you've been taking classes in accounting, right, which is about sort of the, 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 the number side, accounting for the number side of the business, right? You take classes in organizational behavior, which is about the people side of the business. Supply chain and operations is about the operations side of the business, right? Marketing is about connecting with customers and the marketing side of the business. And finance is about getting capital in particular to do all the things you need to do. So those are all of the functional areas. But somehow, you've got to connect all of those together into a coherent whole, a unified whole, so that you now can create competitive advantage in the marketplace and succeed as an organization. And that requires looking at the big picture. Big picture means looking at industry that you're in, environment, all of this other stuff. Um, the other thing I've learned over the years um, is that um, you know some ideas just aren't that great. This is porcupine on a stick. Um, you know, new business idea it just didn't fly. Um, and we probably all have some ideas as to why it didn't fly. Um, one of the things that we are going to try and get to in this course a bit is how do you come up with innovative business ideas? But that's typically not something that's taught in strategy classes. What we try to do is we teach you basic tools so that you don't make porcupine on a stick kinds of mistakes. Let me give you an example. So um, this has been about 10 years ago. 10, 11 years ago, we have the emergence of the internet. And um, we have all of these new companies that are being launched on the internet. At the time, I'm a full-time faculty member at the Wharton School, and I'm the course head for a course for all MBAs called Global Strategic Management. Okay, so I, I finished my, I spent five years at Bain & Company as a consultant and manager, went to UCLA for my PhD in strategy, and then I went to Wharton as a faculty member. So I don't claim to know a lot about the internet. Right? This is this new thing that's emerged. But I do know some basics about global strategy. And there's a couple of fundamental concepts. One of the fundamental concepts is that the industries that go global first, the products that go global first, meaning you have to be a global player in order to succeed, are products that are what we call very high value to bulk. If you want a formula, think transportation cost as a percentage of total product price. So these are products like diamonds, microchips, right? Expensive products, but does it cost much to ship a diamond or pharmaceutical drugs? Not a lot compared to the product price. Now the flip side of that 
is um, products that are low valuable. These don't become very, you know, global. Think ice. How many global ice manufacturers are there? What does it cost to buy a block of ice? Anybody know? Maybe about, Maybe about, about 50. What would it cost to manufacture here and ship it to China? Okay, if you don't want it to arrive in China as water, it's going to be very expensive because you have to send it refrigerated, right? No global ice, ice manufacturers out there. Okay, think about, um, you know, there are very bulky products around, you know, bricks, concrete, and a lot of things like that that are very, very heavy, big, large, and therefore cost of ship. So I watched the internet companies launch, and there were three or four companies that launched in, we'll call them the petfood.com space. So I'm looking at petfood.com. Now, I don't know whether this is a good business idea or not, but I do know something about value of both. So I'm thinking, well, what does it cost to buy a 25-pound bag of dog food? Anybody in here ever actually buy your own dog food? About a 30-pound bag just to get a day for 40 bucks. Okay, mm -hmm. for 40 bucks. Yeah. And what do you think it would cost to ship a 30-pound bag of dog food? Anybody know what it costs to ship 30, 30 pounds? <clears throat> depends to where, depends how far. Depends if it's coming from a, if you have a national, most of these have a few national warehouses, so you have to ship a few states, but the, the, the typical cost is about half of the price, at least half the price of the dog food. So I'm looking at petfood.com, and I'm thinking, I don't quite get, you know, I can see that you might want to buy certain things, perhaps online, that are lighter, but I can't see doing pet food. Because it's, I'm not sure people are willing to pay a 50, 60% premium for the, the luxury, the convenience of having shipped to their door. So I was not surprised when all of the petfood.com companies went out of business or were acquired or teamed with a brick and mortar company like petsmart.com. My view is that was a porcupine on a, on a, on a stick kind of mistake. Right? There, if they would apply some basic fundamental principles, you could avoid mistakes. So we're going to try and teach you in this course some basic fundamental principles of strategy so at least you don't make mistakes like this. Okay, we're going to do a lot of cases in this course. That's the, the pedagogy, and you will need to be prepared for those cases. Um, the most effective answers tend to have three characteristics. Number one, they're data-driven. So. Here we have two fish in a bowl, and the one says to the other, I guess he made it. It's been more than a week since he went over the wall. And, and I view this as an unsupported assertion. You assert something that you don't really have any data or evidence to support. So um, a few years ago, let me see if I can. A few years ago, um, Coke decided to do joint venture <coughs> with Procter & Gamble. It was going to take them into the snack foods business. We did this as an article, as a little case, around whether or not Coke should get into the snack foods business. Pepsi's in the snack food business. They own Frito-Lay, right? So, um, so people were saying, yeah, they should get in the snack foods business. Why? Seems like a good business to be in. Pepsi's in it. So the question I ask is, well, how do you know if the snack foods business is an attractive business? A lot of Pepsi's in it. Does that mean it's an attractive business? What, what, might, what data might you gather that would help you have an idea as to whether or not snack foods is an attractive business? Yes? What synergies you can develop between your current business and that future business? Okay, so, so part of it is looking at whether or not you actually bring something to the table to this business. But I'm just saying, as a standalone business, snack foods, how do I know it's attractive? Yes? Uh, um, how well are you be able to compete with Pepsi because their price might, I mean, their price of cost but, of production. But we don't know yet. We don't know yet how well we'll compete until we launch, <clears throat> until we're in the business. I'm just saying, standalone business, how do I know if it's a good business? Uh, looking at margins and growth opportunities. Okay, industry. so you could probably look at margins. Most likely, though, the way we tend to look at attractiveness of industries is let's look at the average profitability of companies that compete in the snack foods industry. If you took all the companies in the snack food businesses, business and average their profits, is that high or is it low? Do companies make money in this business or not? If you do this with airlines, you're going to see, on average, 
not a good business. You better have a great strategy or it's not going to work. Um, if you do this in the steel business, same thing. But, um, but if you averaged all of the profits and looked at, I think profitability and growth would probably be two things that you'd look at as to whether or not this is an attractive industry. And those, those are, that's the kind of data you can get. Okay, so when possible, you want to use data from the case or from other places in order to um, be able to answer business problems. <clears throat> Second one is you want to use theory, because sometimes the data is not there. Here we have some Vikings. They're out to sea, and the, one of the lead Vikings says to the other, I've got two Omar, a strange feeling like we've just been going in circles. Now, if there was only a theory as to what might cause a ship to go in circles, you might have an idea of where to look, right? <clears throat> Sometimes you don't have the numbers. You have to rely on theory. So later in this course, we're going to talk about um, how a company like Merrill Lynch, an established company in financial services, how should they respond to a new entrant like E-Trade? Should they respond at all? Should they ignore them? Should they buy them? Should they partner with them? What should they do? It's very hard. You don't have the data to decide what to do. So here you have to apply a theory to say, here's what they should do. I don't, can't get all the data. I can't do a cost-benefit analysis of whether they should enter this, the financial services businesses um, online as sort of a, the, you know, E-Trade is sort of a, uh, the financial services for do-it-yourselfers. Right? It's, it's like the Home Depot of financial services. <clears throat> Is Merrill Lynch the Home Depot of financial services today? No. They compete with brokers, branches, high-touch service, right? Very high quality. That's, not their, that's really not their strategy. So should they get into this other business? Well, you need a theory as to how to think about it to decide whether or not they should do that. The third thing that I'm looking for in terms of answers to business problems and cases is things that are novel and creative. This is something I've tried focusing on more in the last few years. <clears throat> Here we have uh, Dogbert, the consultant, going to Dilbert's boss, and he says, it's easy to create a strategy. Write down everything you do, preceded by the phrase, increase our market share by. Hey, that's pretty easy. Probably any of us could be consultants if that's all we needed to do is go in and offer that. <clears throat> the boss thinks, and he says, well, what if we change what we do? He's on his game. Call me, and I'll sell you some more value. <laughs> right? Good solutions to business problems are often creative, creative, novel, haven't been used before. Sometimes they are something that you grab from one context and apply to another context. That's great. But we're looking for things that are a little bit more creative, a little bit more novel. So anyway, that, that's um, an introduction to sort of, to me, I've been at BYU now for 10 years, 11, actually 11 years, um, and uh, I, uh, I grew up in Provo, I went to Provo High School, my dad was a professor here, he took me to the football games, I learned to be, believe BYU blue, you know, many, many years ago as a young kid, which is one of the reasons I decided to come back. After spending a few years at Wharton, um, I did keep my uh, position at Wharton. I still teach their executive MBA program. Their executive MBA uh, on their West Coast program. I'll get their strategy uh, courses from me. Um, but <clears throat> full time, I'm here at BYU. And um, I, for years, um, thought that one of the things we could do at BYU to make our market strategy and in the, in the, in the um, sort of in the field of strategy, meaning consulting field, organizations, and so on, would be to create a program like this to help prepare you for that and to help you to, to um, sort of stand out from your peers at other universities. And that was the goal of this program. And uh, so far, I've been delighted at the results. We're in four years. And, uh, and each year, the class, I think, gets stronger. Um, the placement rates, we've basically been at essentially 100% every year, three months after graduation for those who are going on the market. And uh, the job opportunities look pretty good. So we're, we're hoping for more of the same for you. Let's move on to a presentation of some of the key ideas that we want to talk about today. 
So strategic management. I want to give you an overview. What does it mean? We're going to address three questions. What does it mean to have a strategy? What is the key to a successful strategy? And how can you evaluate a good or bad strategy before the fact, before you launch it? So what does it mean to have a strategy? When you hear the word strategy, what comes to mind? Yes? Let's say a game plan or knowledge about what types of goals you want to accomplish. OK, something about a game plan to accomplish goals, right? Yes? A way of accomplishing something in a way of like, in recognizing that there will be responses from other people. OK, so there's, there's something about this game plan that has to realize that there's competition, and there may be response and counter responses that are required. Yes? Okay, from the chapter, a plan to achieve competitive advantage, right? A plan to achieve competitive advantage. So if we think about strategy, you're trying to come up with a strategy to achieve competitive advantage. Why? Well, the way we keep score in business is by generating shareholder value, by creating value in a company. <clears throat> and one of the reasons that you personally want to work for a company that has a good strategy and competitive advantage is that research shows the companies with competitive advantages that deliver high shareholder value pay more money to people at all levels of the organization. Why? Because they can afford to. You only have to give enough to shareholders to keep them happy. If you're doing a good job of running the business and making a lot of money, then you get to keep more of it. Okay, so there's four parts uh, four key strategic choices that you have to make with regard to a strategy. One is, what markets are we going to pursue? How are, are we going to offer unique value in those particular markets? What resources and competencies, capabilities do we need to deliver that unique value better than the competition? And then how do we sustain it? How do we create barriers to imitation so that others can't come in and do the same thing that we just did and do it better and sort of steal the market from us. OK, <clears throat> so that's what it means to have a strategy. We're going to talk about now the key to a successful strategy. And I want to give you a mini case. So when I was working at Bain & Company, I worked for a client, a food retailing client. And we were developing a market entry strategy. This was a city in the Midwest. Um, these are not the names of the grocery stores that were in this particular city. But I chose the names to just give you an idea that these were uh, Harmon's, Acme is a, a, a Philadelphia Northeast sort of local grocery store chain. So there were two that were like local grocery stores and one that was a national grocery store chain like Safeway. Three, there were three stores in the city. Now, our analysis had shown basically there was a freeway that went here and you came into the city from this side or this side. This was the main street and the Harmons and the Acme were the oldest stores in the city on the main street. Harmons was 50 years old. Acme was about 35 years old. Safeway had come in about 15 years earlier. This was the main part of the city. The growth had been out this direction in terms of sort of the suburbs. Safeway had built a store out in that growth area. Now, we had to decide whether to enter that city with one store or maybe two stores. We had to have a market entry strategy. And we had to decide where to put the store or stores if we went into the market with more than one. This was a high growth market. There had not been an entry for 15 years. When we looked at the number, the population per store and per square foot, our calculation showed that all of these stores were extremely profitable. So we knew there was a lot of money that could be made by entering this particular market. So my question to you is, how would you think about entering this particular market in terms of location, number of stores, and what's your logic? And you can ask, if you, have, if you want a little bit more data, you can ask me for a little more data. Yes? Good. So the first national stores is the client. They have uh, stores in the Northeast and the Midwest, so they're like a super regional chain. And I would say they're basically a middle of the road Safeway kind of grocery store chain. In fact, all of these are your, this is a basic Midwest town 
There's, none of these are really high end. They're not like warehouse stores. They're you know, your basic grocery store. Yes? <clears throat> so I can't give you the specific densities, but this represents 90% of the population of the city. The circle does. So 90% of the city's population falls within that circle. Yes? And one another competitive advantage is that each of those stores and maybe... Right now we can't see that there are any particular competitive advantages. Other than, you know, your location makes you more attractive for customers around you because one of the things we do know is that 70% of people shop at the grocery store that's closest to their home. And you're going to, 30% will drive farther, um, but they have to have a reason to drive farther. Of the 30% of the of the that drive f farther, on average, half of those will drive farther for lower price, and half will drive farther for like better selection, better quality. But most people shop at the place closest to their home. So how do our correct? prices and quality compare? We are a... Safeway like grocery store chain. I mean, you can think about how does the how does the you know the prices and quality compare for yeah Smiths and Macy's or Harmons or you know there there are some some subtle differences but not huge. Okay. Yes. Well, I was going to ask if we had any differentiating factors, like if we focused on organic food, like whole no, foods or we're a basic. We're we are a meat and potatoes grocery store chain. Yes. Okay. I think we're going to focus on the people that are already there. Okay. And I would put the store or smack that in the center. Okay. And what's your logic for being in the center? Well, I think that if there's really 90% of the people that are in that circle, then I think that's you're going to get a lot of people that are close by there. And you'll also be able to attract a little bit off the food, but maybe not as much for those that are maybe willing to drive a little farther for a better price. So if you put it here, you're going to get all of maybe the folks out here that are closest to your store. Yeah. Okay. What, what, who, who, who disagrees? Who would want to do something different? Yes? I personally would put it a little bit lower because if you put it at the, exactly in the middle, it's like you have to compete with the people on top. And if you put it here, then you, they're kind of going this way or this way or this way. So you want to be down more in the territory where there's no competition. Yeah. Let's go to sort of the, 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 the virgin territory. Yes? I, I, I agree with um, Johannes. That's right. Okay. Okay, so, so one option is, and they were called finest stores, one option is let's put it down here because, look, we're going to avoid rivalry if we put it down there. And we're going to provide, what's our unique value? Well, it's convenience for these folks in this particular area. We're going to be more convenient, and therefore we're going to attract those folks. But we don't really necessarily have a sustainable cost or differentiation advantage. What if Safeway, what if you put a store here and then Safeway puts a store out here too? Next to you or near you? Could they do that? If they do that, what does that do to your market entry strategy? They could do that, but then again, it wouldn't make sense for them to put it there because they'll be in central. And, and, I mean, do you want, yeah, so the question is, I wouldn't want to put it there because, you know, you'd say, look, you got a new store and you got two new stores going against each other. That doesn't make sense. They won't do it because it won't look attractive to them, is one option, is that you say they won't do it because it doesn't look attractive, because there's more rivalry. Yes? I was just going to say, if, if we look at the economy and the scale, maybe all these um, stores are buying from the same distribution, or from the same suppliers? They all pretty much will have their own distribution to their stores. Okay. Because then, if, if that was the case, yeah. they could, um, this finance could put multiple stores in and essentially preemptively box out. So is that what you're recommending? Um, well, you said that the, they all have their own suppliers. So they all have their own distribution. So you'll have a distribution warehouse in a different city, a different area. A truck will bring in the products on a regular basis to each store. But you don't have a truck that's going to harm it. These guys compete with each other. They're not sharing a truck. Does that make sense? OK, at the back. There's one thing that you mentioned that we can kind of run into a lot. You said at the top, there's the most growth. 
I'd say the growth is out this direction. So it's out all this direction. It was heaviest out this direction, now it's coming out this direction. Okay. Yes? I was going to ask, what are, there, what are the barriers to entry for the group? There are no particular barriers to entry other than getting land for your store location. And for the most part, that's not a problem. And this particular market was growing rapidly because a couple of local businesses had been successful, export businesses, and so basically there was just, they were creating a lot of growth for the market. Okay? Let's see, who has not had their hand up and been picked yet? Let's go here. Benjamin. Sure, I'd like to know a little more about the profit margin because you could take the 7 Eleven approach and just put in three stores. Put one in the middle, put one in between each one. In the put in smaller stores? Put in smaller stores. So you, be, you do more of a convenience yeah. play. What do you think about that? Aren't there, do you think there are 7 Eleven stores in this market? There are three grocery stores. We, don't, we haven't looked at convenience stores because that would be sort of a different. So, so there. The 7 Eleven approach in that you take. You, 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 do just you do multiple stores, but you do most, multiple grocery stores. Right. So this is sort of uh, like it was Philip, right, you, that you had suggested as well. So another option would be hey, let's put in multiple stores. In fact, this was one of the recommendations that we made to our client, Finest. Three stores. And we wanted them all next to the existing stores. Why would we do that? What's the logic for doing this? Yes, Chloe. <clears throat> yeah, we want to be able to get at all of the customers, but let's sort of think about what, what are we trying to have happen here? Yes. And you're, when you put an ad in the paper, you don't have an ad in the paper for one store, right? It's an ad for three stores. It, it just cuts your advertising costs by a third relative to the competition per store on a per store basis. It cuts your distribution costs on a per store basis. But for this to work, do you think, do you think these three stores can be profitable if these three st other stores stay in business? No way. If you're going in with this approach, you are trying to kill some competitor stores. You are overstoring the market substantially. There isn't room. You're jumping in the water with your competitor, and we're basically saying, let's see who can hold each other's head down longer. And our goal here was to kill at least these two stores and be on this side to get the new area. So if we could kill these two stores, then we'd own here with a new store, here with a new store, and this with the newer area. And can anyone come back in? and with a counter response and beat us on cost. Safeway could add another store perhaps, but once we've got three stores, we have a market share advantage, which gives us a cost advantage. Now this approach was deemed a little too aggressive for our client. They did not choose this approach. They chose this one instead. <clears throat> we looked at which of these stores was the weakest. Okay, so another strategy principle. So this is the law of the jungle, the herd. You pick on the weak, the infirm, the easiest to kill. If you want market share, don't go after the strongest player. You go after the weakest players, customers, right? So we went after the oldest store, which here it's labeled Harmon's, but this was the oldest store. We felt two stores would still overstore the market enough that it would, and these, we looked at their finances and we felt like they would not be able to sustain this store. And what we wanted to do was put in a larger store so we could beat them on variety of product offered and because we had two stores, we could beat them on price because we'd have lower costs. So let's apply our framework here. Finest, why does Finest win with customers and how do they deliver that unique value? We've already talked about they've selected this market to enter because it was high growth. So they've chosen this market. Now, what's the unique value that they offer that customers will say, I'm going to pick finest stores instead of the competition? Well, if we go in with two stores or three, we're going to be able to offer lower price or at least advertise lower price and at least price match or beat the competition on key items because we have lower costs. Because we have three stores versus, or two stores versus one store. Gives us a cost advantage. We're going to build larger stores than the competition so that we can uh, ensure that we can offer more variety, 
That's also something that some customers want. And we're going to be just as convenient, if possible, at least the store we're trying to kill, by being next door. How do we do it? Well, by, uh, by having more stores than the competition, we're going to have lower local costs around advertising, training, distribution, and so on. <clears throat> we're going to have larger stores that offer more variety. That's not easy for them to knock out walls and expand their stores. Possible, but not easy. And we're going to have greater brand awareness in that market because we have more stores than the competition. That brings more brand awareness. So now we know why we win with customers and we know how we win. And we've thought about barriers to imitation. The reason we want to go in with more than one store is we don't want to put in one store and then have the competition be able to counter and put a store in there that would create a competitive advantage for the competitor. Now, if I was Costco and I was going into this market, would I use the same approach? Why not? Yes? Does Costco's strategy completely different? They are not your typical grocery store. Not only do they sell bulk, but they sell a bunch of things that aren't grocery items. And so the way that they'd look at those would be different. They wouldn't be a complete competitor because you'd want to look at Kmart's and Walmart's and shop those. Yeah, and they're, and they're trying to offer something that's unique in terms of low cost, high quality goods that's low cost. If you're offering something that's unique to this market, you probably just want to go to the highest traffic area, wherever that is, and you put in one store. If it's right in the middle, if you think of you know, this sort of approach, if this is where it'll be equally you know, accessible to all customers and I'm doing something that's totally unique, that's probably where I put it, wherever you can get the most traffic. If I'm a high-end um, you know, Whole Foods or I'm a, a Trader Joe's and I'm, and I'm trying to differentiate in some way, same thing. Right? I'm not going to go in with three stores. I'm going to go with one for the whole area, and I'm just going to try and go to the highest traffic area for my target customer segment. Does that make sense? But in this case, because there were, you know, basically all the stores were offering a very similar value proposition in terms of products, that is the approach. Now, if you think about how, um, uh, uh, why a company wins with a set of customers in terms of offering unique value, this is the second decision. It's usually low price or product differentiation. In other words, I've got lower costs and therefore I price below the competition. Or I may have higher costs, but I provide enough product differentiation and people are willing to pay for it. This is the willingness to pay part of the equation. And therefore, I can price, I can price at a premium. And I can succeed with either one of those approaches. But those are sort of two generic approaches to think about offering unique value in the market. So there's low cost efficiency, it's like E-Trade, like Walmart. Differentiation, premium value, it's like Apple or Merrill Lynch. And I'm going to offer a third that you don't often see in a lot of textbooks, not even in chapter one of the one I gave you. And by the way, for a couple of you who have given feedback, thank you very much. Yes? I just have a question. Do we have access to your... I will put all of these on after class and they will go to Blackboard. Yeah, you'll have access to all of these. The third one is... I think of as a value strategy. And it's basically, it's sort of an in-between a pure differentiator and um, low cost. So think about Charles Schwab in the financial services. Charles Schwab at one time was the discount broker. They were, their strategy was low cost efficiency. You called in to do trades, they didn't have many branches. Then all of a sudden E-Trade comes in with a lower cost structure. It's all electronic they can no longer be the discount broker. They can't be low cost. So what have they, where have they moved? Do you know what their, what, what do their advertisements say? Talk to Chuck, right? You can talk to somebody, but it's not as expensive as Merrill Lynch if you were going for a broker, right, or branches. So it's, a val it's like it's the better value. It's not the low end, the inex least expensive. It's not the high end, but it's this interesting mix of a combination of, of reasonable cost and reason, reasonable differentiation. Costco, I think, is really a value strategy. You don't go, if you want to get the cheapest, least expensive items, you go to Sam's Club. It has cheaper items than Costco. Costco typically has higher quality products with higher prices than Sam's Club. But for the price, for the quality of the items, people go to Costco. They think it's good value. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so you, you, you'll sometimes hear out, out in you know, companies, they sort of think, we're trying to offer the best value. That's sort of what they're talking about. So would that be like, if we were to do it on a university standpoint, like low cost would be like community colleges, different 
and BYU. So BYU devalued. Aren't we? Yeah. So that, yeah. So so here here's an interesting point. So can you be low cost and differentiated at the same time? Okay, it's hard to do. In fact, Mike Porter, one of the well-known strategy faculty at, at, at Harvard, has often said companies that try to do that get stuck in the middle. They don't do either well. But think about BYU. A lot of people come here because it's low cost. But a lot of people come here because of the differential, differential, different environment, right? You actually, you'd pay more to come here if you had to. So um, there are some cases where you might actually find that a lower cost player could also provide something that's differentiated for a particular type of customer. Now what we're offering here, it doesn't appeal to everybody in the US, right, or in the world, but it appeals to a certain segment of the market, okay? All right, <clears throat> so strategy rests on competitive uh, uh, advantage, and this advantage tends to come from the activities that you perform. So you've got to do something different in order to be different. So let's think about competitive advantage here. It means doing different things. <clears throat> think about the way Skype places a phone call versus the way Verizon or AT&T or a landline company places a phone call. How is it different, the activities that they each perform? Anybody know? How does Skype place a phone call? <clears throat> what kind of people work at Skype? Programmers. programmers. Software programmers. They write software, you download it, they free ride on your investment in your computer, right? It's actually pretty expensive to place that call once you look at the cost of the computer and your internet service. But you figure, they figure you're going to have that anyway. So they kind of free ride on it. They don't have to buy towers to do cell calls. They don't have to have switching equipment like AT&T, they have a very different way of placing a phone call. Um, so in fact, once when I had a chance to talk to Nicholas Zenstrom, the founder of Skype, I asked him, how many people did you have working for your company when you sold to eBay for 2.6 billion? You know how many employees they had? 200. 200 employees, 2.6 billion value, you do the math, okay? They all did very, very well in, 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 the, in that acquisition. Because all they did was write software, and then you download it, and we'll do a, a, a case later on Skype uh, around what they did uh, well to be successful doing voice over IP. That's a very different way of placing a phone call than building a set of cell phone towers, setting up stores, having cell phones, right? There's a whole different set of activities that you perform. They win because of cost, they're more efficient, and they do different things all together. The other thing is you do similar things differently. Southwest Airlines. We'll do a case on them. But think about Southwest. How different are they really from Delta? They both have pilots. They have flight attendants. They have Boeing 737s. But Southwest makes money year after year, and Delta hasn't. We'll look into it. They do similar things. But Southwest has done a few things differently enough that they're able to make money in a way that Delta, United, American, others have not been able to do. Okay? So competitive advantage, if we go back to the activities, this is around the resources and capabilities. That is really a key part of strategy is how do you deliver that unique value better than anybody else? Okay? And then you want to sustain it, which brings us to um, <clears throat> uh, some examples of competencies that confer advantage. So, De Beers, diamond company. Why do they win? Well, because raw material sourcing for them historically has been a source of competitive advantage because they've owned the diamond mines. That gives them preferred access to diamonds. That allows them to inflate the price. Okay? And that's not good for those of you who are recently married or wanting to get married, you know diamonds aren't cheap. And that's part of the reason. But, so one of their keys to their competitive advantage has been their raw material sourcing strategy. Um, research and development. Sony, historically, Gen Genentech, uh, a, bio, uh, or a, a pharmaceutical company, they win because of new products or have historically based upon research and development. Apple and IDEO win because of design. 
Intel and Boeing because of their production and scale in production. Toyota because of their production technology, the Toyota production system. eBay wins because of the product range and variety that you can get on the auction site. Um, and because of network effects, which we will talk about later. Panasonic does well um, in their business because of application engineering. They're really good at process and, and um, standardized quality. Sales and marketing, Procter & Gamble, Virgin Group, Distribution Retail Network, Starbucks, McDonald. There are different ways that you can deliver your unique value better than the competition. And it, it could be at any of these different stages of the value chain where you beat the competition and you win. <clears throat> All right. So that gives you an idea of the key to a successful strategy. It's offering unique value and delivering that unique value better than the competition. So how do you evaluate a good or a bad strategy before you launch it? That's a challenge. I'm going to give you a mini case here. In the mid-1980s, Delta teamed up with American Express to offer a special marketing program. If you bought a ticket on Delta and used the American Express card, you got triple miles. This is a way to try and build loyalty to get people to use the card. One of the reasons they wanted to do it is that their average load factors were at 78% at the time, meaning on average their planes were 78% full. So what's the cost of putting one more person on a plane that's 78% full? No. Okay, I think of it as peanuts, literally, right? Maybe a Coke and peanuts. But the marginal cost is basically zero, right? It's almost zero. It's not like you're gonna have, you don't have to hire anybody else for that plane. You probably don't need much more fuel. Um, so it's basically almost zero. So that means you get one more person to pay, it's all profit. That's what they're trying to do. How do we fill the planes? We're going to give you triple miles. This is the program. Evaluate it. The good idea, bad idea, why? And I will let you, you can ask if you want a little bit more data. Once again, you can ask a question. Johannes? Okay, so one question you're raising is, this depends on whether or not people will actually use the American Express card and fly more. Yeah. So who or people? some people might switch from another airline though and fly us, right? So they don't have to necessarily fly more, they could just switch from another airline to fly us. Right, Minji? Oh, the advantage or the incentive that they get from triple miles are people usually fly a lot, and they're already flying. So you're giving away more to your existing customers. Yeah, so you might not really get that 28% bill. Okay. Because some of it may be frequent flyers now using free tickets. Okay. Who has not had, who have I not called on yet? If I haven't called on you, keep your hand up. Yes. Um, I would want to know what American Express is going to do for us since we're using them. So what American Express does is they give them a slightly lower uh, card rate and they um, put up, they split the promotional expenses for this marketing program. So that's what they have. Okay? Yes? I just want to know the American Express's market share in terms of credit cards. So if they uh, have a large percentage of... They have a large share, they have a large market share in credit cards, especially among the business travelers. Even if it's a large share, then I would say... Pro probably, they probably have 65, 65, 70% share. Okay, let me get a couple more comments and then I'm going to have you vote. Yes? I would ask how long is this program going to be? Is it for a limited time? If, if so, then you Good question. the other companies or the other customers and cut it off and they'll... They're, they're thinking this is at least six months. But there's not an end date? There's not a clear end date at this point. They're just, right now, they're just offering it triple miles if you fly Delta, use American Express card. Um, 
helping out with your existing customer base, you are building your customer base. And then once they're bigger, you can cut off that deal and your customer's already big, your customer base is already large. Okay, yes. Um, I'd be a little bit worried about cannibalization, which was discussed already, but also a little bit concerned about is, is this sustainable? Um, if we introduce a program like this, are we gonna get into a price war with another airline? It's gonna be something similar. It's then just gonna cut into- So if you were running United Airlines and Delta does this, you're running Delta, you've said, let's do this. You're running United, what are you gonna do? Well, if, if it looks, if, to me, if it looks like this is gonna be a profitable strategy, then I would just copy it and I'd keep my, my customers. Maybe I would team up with a different credit card company. So what would you do? Uh, I would team up with, with Visa or, 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 or not Visa, yeah, Visa or MasterCard or whoever. Okay, you take Visa. Okay, you're running uh, Northwest Airlines. Okay. What are you gonna do? Grab MasterCard. Okay, uh, you've got uh, United Airlines. You ready to go for Discover card? Diner's card? <laughs> how many of you think, how many of you want to be in a battle where you're going up there with Diner's card, right, as our partner, and Delta's got American Express, which is the dominant card used by business travelers, and those are the travelers you really want because they're the ones that typically um, pay the higher rates, have to fly during the week, don't stay the weekends, okay? So it's a this is a challenge. I I if you don't, um, match them, people will move for triple miles. We know that people behave that way. They will move for triple miles. Well, yes. Right now, Delta is teamed with American Express, Visa is teamed with Southwest, and... This, this actually led to what we're... What, it led to creating cards that were co-branded, yeah. right? But this was the first step. And this happened... Yes, let me get... Uh, And Delta, or American Express and another airline, any, yeah. right? Any airline. It's more attractive, although some people might go out. What American Express hopes is that people will go out and get an American Express card, because now I can get triple miles when I fly on Delta, or, right? That's so you're, they're, they're hoping that they'll get more people to use it. Now, let me tell you what happened here. This happened in the mid-1980s. Uh, this is when I was, uh, it was probably 87, 86, 87. I was working at Bain & Company. I was flying a lot. Delta launches triple miles. Within the week, every other major carrier announced that they would offer triple miles. And they didn't care how you paid. American Express, Visa, there's no time to develop a partnership, right, at that point. Can they do that? Sure, they can offer triple miles. So now how does Delta respond? Do you go to quadruple miles? That seems silly now, doesn't it? Because they can imitate you just like that. One of the problems with this approach was that there was no barrier to imitation. When you do something, when you take a strategic action, you want to ask yourself, what's the barrier to imitation? If there's none, if they can imitate you tomorrow by dropping their price and make it easy and quick, and you have no cost advantage over time, for example, that's a problem. Because what happened here is everybody gave triple miles. Who won? The, the customer, I won, I love this. I flew on every airline, I got triple miles all the time. This went on for about two years, they did these battles. And then finally the government says, you know what, this looks like a pretty big liability that you're building up. You need to estimate and calculate the liability and put it on your balance sheet. Ouch. They started to calculate the liability. It was big. And so what they did was they changed their card programs. They grandfathered you on your old miles. They got rid of triple miles. They actually lowered, they actually increased the number of miles you needed to take a trip. They did a variety of things because what happened was this was a strategic move that everybody felt they had to, to imitate. It raised everybody's costs, but nobody was better off relative to anybody else. Delta, you could argue, could, was even a little worse off because they were teamed with Delta or with American Express and you had to use American Express. But they got the, the, the benefit of American Express put up promotional dollars to help fund this. So they also got some visibility. And that led to the, a partnership and a relationship that they later created the co-branded card. Okay, so it's very important. Good strategies have barriers to imitation. You've got to ask yourself, what's the cost of the strategic initiative? 
How much is it going to cost us to do this? Triple miles or whatever it might be. Then, how long will it take for competitors to imitate it? Because they probably will try and imitate it if it provides value, unique value to the customers. And the key thing is, is there a barrier to imitation? If there is not a barrier to imitation, and this is the fourth of the four cho choices, if there's not a barrier to imitation, then you've got to think carefully about whether you want to do it. Now, in some industries, if you have a barrier to imitation, if you can do it and they can't do it for a month, you might take it. Hey, we'll take an advantage for a month, and we'll look for something else during the next month to give us an advantage the next month. Right? So you've got to think through sort of the, the cost-benefit of any strategic initiative. But just please be aware, some things that often look really good on paper, if you haven't thought about the competitor response, you, you can be in trouble. And that's the issue of sustainability and barriers to imitation. All right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> strategy is fundamentally, on the formulation side, is about making four strategic choices. One, which markets are we going to compete in? That means which industries, which product markets, where can we make money? Two, how do we offer unique value in those markets? <clears throat> Why do we win with the customer? That means we're going to be low cost, we're going to be differentiated, or perhaps some sort of a value strategy. Third is how are we going to deliver that unique value better than the competition? Why can we be low cost on a consistent basis relative to the competition? Why can we deliver better quality products on a consistent basis better than the competition? That goes back to the activities that you perform, the competencies you build. <clears throat> and then finally, and that's related to the fourth, which is how do we create sustainable competitive advantage by building barriers to imitation. Okay? So that's an initial framework that we're going to use for the course to understanding strategy and the strategic choices made by the leaders of organizations. Good. We'll see you next Monday.